welcome you all again to our service here in the church this morning. It's good to have you all with us, and we hope that you're comfortable. If you're too warm with that, open up a window, or uh, you make sure you're comfortable is the main thing. And also for those that are listening on the internet, well, we do, I pray that you might know the Lord's help and blessing. We're going to turn to the Word of God, to Genesis and chapter 14. Genesis and chapter 14. We're going to continue with our short series on Lot. And we have covered as to how Lot and his uncle Abraham have both separated one from another. But very, very shortly afterwards, Lot gets himself into trouble. And the uncle that he had wronged in many ways or didn't respect the way that he ought to, he was glad of the uncle to come to his aid again and to help him in time of need. We're going to just break into this story in verse 9, in verse 9 of Genesis 14. With Chedor Loma, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amphrael, king of Shinar, and Arahok, a king of Eleazar, four kings with five. And the vale of Sidon was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their rituals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abraham the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the land of uh, the plain of Mamre, uh, the Amorite, brother of Eschol, and brother of Anar, and these were confederate with Abraham. And when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Horbat, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the women also, and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer, and of the kings that were with him, at the valley of Shava, which is the king's deal. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered them, thine enemies into thy, thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons, and take the goods to thyself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest I should say I have made Abraham rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men went with me, Anar, Eskol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. And we're going to end the reading of God's word there. And may God bless it to our hearts uh, this morning. For those of you that were with us last Lord's Day morning, I'm going to recap a little bit as to what we looked at. And also, I, um, for the benefit maybe of those that perhaps weren't with us, we have been covering the story of Abraham and that of his nephew Lot, and how that God had blessed them. Abraham has taken his nephew, he has cared for his nephew, he has provided for his nephew, and God has blessed them greatly. So much so that there's so many cattle that there's not enough land to feed them all. And so Abraham comes to his nephew and he says to his nephew, Look, don't let there be any strife between the two of us. If you go east, I'll go west. You go right, I'll go left. You make the choice as to where you want to go. And so we've been dwelling on that little phrase that Lot chose for himself. And we know that in life, whenever we make choices, 
whether it's our own choices, we'll not always get them right, whether that of our families or whatever, that sometimes in life we can make the wrong choices. But with every choice that we make in life, there are always consequences. And so what has happened and where we've been covering is Lot sees the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. He sees that everything looks very good. He reckons there will be a place he'll be able to get rich quick. And so he chose the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. But he never thought of the spiritual implications of that decision. And how that decision would affect not only Lot, but it would affect his immediate family, and it cost him dearly, not only in time, but also in eternity. And so very, very basically, that is where we're at this morning. Last Lord's Day morning, I was reading another reference, and I want to recap on this again, because this is all the Word of God. And you and I one day will be judged as to how we've walked in the light of the Word of God. I quoted last week Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And we can find our access to God restricted and his grace withheld whenever there is a root of bitterness. And you may remember, those of you that were here, I spoke for some time about the root. And I quoted again Ephesians 4 and 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Roots produce sprigs. Sprigs grow into plants and plants produce fruit. And that is the fruit. It is that of bitterness and wrath and anger. And then we're told that Abraham had a right to be better. He has no doubt been deeply hurt as old Abraham as such. He has done so much for his nephew. And yet his nephew, it seems to be anyway, he only sees himself. And so he's looking for the best for himself in this materialistic world of ours. The consequences of choices in this story. We've covered some of them, but I'll recap before I go into where I want us to look at this morning. He saw the cities of the plain. They were like Egypt. Lot remembered Egypt as a place where he could get rich quick. The passage suggests that there are some things that Lot didn't see whenever he saw only the plains. He didn't see the significance of the name because the word Jordan, it means death. The river descended out of the living waters of Galilee, dropping far below sea level into the Dead Sea, from which there was no outlet. And for those of you that have been in Israel before, no doubt you have been in the Dead Sea. And it is quite an experience because I am not someone that would be able to swim very far. I'm not a big fan or a big lover of water, but 40 years ago, you were able to float in the Dead Sea. You just cannot sink. And so there's people in the Dead Sea and they're floating about and they're reading the newspapers, they're acting the league and all the rest of it because you can't I sink in it. And a gentleman was with me all those years ago from the Shankill Road in Belfast, an elderly man compared to what we were, because we were quite young, another chap and I, whenever we were there. And he lay in that water, and I remember him so well, this big, big man, but he couldn't sink. And he had some laughs in that and photographs with him with the newspaper and all uh, there in the water. Well, outwardly, it was fair to look upon, but spiritually, it meant death. But Lot failed to see that. We know that Lot saw the profitableness of the cities, but he didn't see the moral corruption in the city. And so we know that there was the consequences as a result. He also missed the fact that God's judgment 
was going to fall upon Sodom and destroy the city. Again, Lot saw the prosperity and the beauty of Sodom, but he failed to see there was a place that was marked out for judgment. It was all to be swept away forever. Now, I imagine maybe there's some will say to me, but maybe you could say, but there's no way for Lot to see that these things were going to happen to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And there is a sense maybe where that may be true. But the whole point of the story is that he chose for himself. And you may remember that last Sunday morning that I mentioned as to how even as young people, you make choices, we all do, that could affect our lives forever. I use the illustrations perhaps that uh, a young person could go to apartheid. We know that sadly we heard about a young man who lost his life this week by being at apartheid and taking drugs and so losing his life. There's the consequences and it's rather, rather sad. Many young people maybe see the glamour of the party, the enjoyment of the party and all the rest of it. But there can be the consequences. And I did mention last Sunday morning too that I had a gentleman in our house there uh, the week before last and he said to me about how his parents were tragically killed whenever a young lad of 16 took his parents' car and ploughed into his own parents, or this man was in our house, his parents, 49 years ago, and how a number of the family were left without mother or father. There's always consequences as a result. He could live where he chose, really, because Abraham, he made the right choice because he, in many ways, let God choose for him. Uh, the life of joy, the life of power, the life of love and glory, Abraham was going to experience so much. I was in a shop there one day, and I don't be in very many shops. I don't. I've been in very, very few shops. But the shop that I was in, can't even remember what I was in for, but there was this din of music being played. You know what it's like now? This den of music, and I thought to myself, am I really, is this really true what's been played over here? Do you know what it kept playing? It must be a pop song or something. It's my life. I can do what I like. And that's what was played over and over again. I was in the shop for a few minutes, and I thought to myself, isn't that so many think that way these days? It's my life. I can do what I like. And that's why that you have so many young people too, and of course your older people that are advocating abortion and all because the whole idea is, it's my life. I can do what I like. I can tell you there's always consequences as a result of all that. We know that we have Abraham, and he is going to go in the other direction to the Oaks of Mamre, which means fatness, it meant also fellowship, and we're told that Abraham built an altar to the Lord. I want to say, without getting into this in great depth again, because I did speak in Abraham some years ago, it is so important for us to build our spiritual altars. No matter what else we build, make sure we build our spiritual altars, that that world out there knows exactly that we are serving God. By building the altar, he was confessing that he was nothing but a fallible human being. That's really what he was confessing. We all dwell in a world exactly like that of Abraham and Lot. And so daily, we must make choices. We have only so much of a life to invest in. And I reminded those that were gathered yesterday at the late Ms. McAllister's funeral, there a service there in, in her own home as to how there's only one life and it will soon be passed. And somewhere between the cradle and the grave, we need to make sure above everything else that all is well with our souls. And friends, today, remember the altar is so, so important. 
you and I have only so much time to invest in our lives down here. Maybe we could say like that, I want the world, I want all that the world can offer to me. Well, you can do that. Many are doing that today. Many of God's people even are so uh, caught up with the things of the world that the deceitfulness of riches so often choke the word Jesus said, and we become unfruitful. Many are saying, I want the cities of the plain. Or we can wait like Abraham and be content with the tent, as it were, which reminds us that we're only temporary down here. And we can build our altars and we can enjoy the blessings of God today. He looked for a city, Abraham did, that had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Let me say, dear friends, today, if you are saved, it's very important to keep our eyes focused on the city, looking for that city that hath foundations, that incorruptible place I reserved in heaven for us, Peter tells us. No matter who we are, we all make choices, some good, some not so good. But sometimes the choices that we make they set a series of events which shape in our lives and the lives of our children and even our grandchildren. Sometimes we do. Sometimes people make unwise choices which may cost them dearly. I remember some years ago someone in contact with me here and they said to me they no longer come to this church not for years, but they said, we made a wrong choice. I said to them, I said, well, what was the wrong choice that you made? They said, I can tell you now the biggest mistake that we ever made as parents was we took our children from this Sunday school. That was the mistake. That marriage, yes, all professing Christians and all the rest of it, that marriage is in the rocks this year's. But there's the consequences for it. Do you say for anyone to offend a little child, for anyone to hold back from a little child being taught the word of God, there's consequences as a result. I think it's true to say that the last time that we were in Jersey, I met an old man coming with one of those shopping trolleys. You know those shopping trolleys? You don't see as many of them maybe about, uh, my mother maybe had one, maybe you still have one, a shopping trolley in Wales. Very, very tremendous, an excellent invention. Instead of carrying everything, you just pull your trolley. But I remember thinking to myself, you're a very old man. I was out walking in Jersey, there about St. Hallier that, you're a very old man to be walking about with a shopping trolley. And uh, he was well in front of me, and he would stop every so often, and the shopping trolley was packed. So much packed that whenever I went to pass him in the shopping trolley, I could see what was in the shopping trolley, because the lid was up. Do you know what the shopping trolley was packed with? It was packed with gospel tracts. That man told me he was the name of John Vasling. I'm sure maybe he's not around now. It was John Vasling, an unusual name. I remember saying to him, are you any relation to the Vasling, you know, it uh, is a name. And he told me that there was a connection there. But that man was out in St. Helier giving out gospel tracts, and he was carrying or taking his little wheelie with him with all these tracts. What was he doing? He was investing for eternity. That's what he was doing. But I remember actually stopping and having a chat with him and he told me a little bit about his history, that his history was such for 200 years, he said, the generations before, they were all Christian people. They all knew the Lord. Now, what had been left behind there, which I trust all of us will leave behind whenever we're not around here, was a spiritual legacy. And I remember thinking to myself, 200 years is a long, long time. And here you are, a man in your 80s, out on your own, no fuss about it, pulling your wee trolley along amongst the people, stopping taking out some tracks and then going another bed because I walked and then I met him again. 
our PASCAP uh, meeting. I trust, dear friend, today that we are investing for eternity because the choices that we make will affect the next generations. Now, I, I, um, I believe that so often, even in our own culture, so often people are very quick to identify maybe a grandfather or a great-grandfather or someone else, and maybe there's some chain of events, some root of bitterness that has never been broken in the generations. Friends, if that is the case, it's time to nip it in the bud. It's time to break it and to get through to the living God. You see, choices often result in eternal, uh, significant consequences. Uh, that is what happened here. Lot and Abraham, remember, increased in wealth. Whenever God blessed Abraham, he also blessed Lot. And so it led to problems. And that's why the land wasn't, didn't provide enough for all the cattle. Everyone, of course, it seems to be whenever uh, some of the most unhappy families, as it were, are those who are wealthy. How often a will divides a family? How often a will? Everyone wants maybe a portion of the inheritance. And that's what's happening here, really, because Lot wants the good land for himself. There was increased strife. It led to increased responsibility for the choices that was being made. Lot wasn't just deciding for himself. He was deciding for his family. You may have read in the news yesterday where someone has won, I think I'm right in saying, is the 111 million on the lottery, uh, on the lotto. I feel sorry for whoever that is. Because that will not bring happiness to that family. It'll bring anything but it. Whoever they are. Now, I hope there's nobody in here. I hope it's not. I hope you don't do the lotto. I hope that you're not out to get rich quick. I was in a shop I, one day, I said back uh, a couple of years ago, and this lady that actually, <laughs> yes, did come to this church here. I haven't seen her for quite a while. And she was getting her numbers and all sorted out. And then she looked round and she saw me. I think if the ground had opened up, she would have, she, uh, she would have been swallowed. She was so embarrassed. But why should she be embarrassed? Because she saw me. She, she's never more embarrassed than she's doing it uh, before an open gone. Well, that's for another day. I want you to get the fact that Lot wasn't just deciding for himself. And whenever you make decisions in life, they will affect others. They will. His family and his many servants and their families would be affected by his decision. The increased responsibility for choices led to the increased wickedness because in Lot's case, he chose Sodom. In Abraham's case, he chose blessing whenever he was choosing Canaan. You know, the previous chapter in Genesis chapter 13 is the first mention of wealth in the Word of God. Remember, it can be a blessing, but it can also be a curse. It can bring with it a lot of trials and problems too. So Lot's increased wealth led to the strife, which led him to make the worst decision of his life. You know, if there's anything practical that I would want to tell anybody that's in this church here, because I've often challenged myself and said this to, and said it to our family, never make a big decision whenever you're tired. Because you'll usually regret it. Never make it whenever you're tired. And I don't know whether, I'm sure Lot wasn't tired. He saw, he saw the planes and he thought, I'll get rich quick at this. I'm going to conclude this morning but how do you and I make good choices in life? Now, I'll say it again. There's not one of us here. I think we would be complete liars if anybody stood up and said that you've made choices or I've made choices in life that you wouldn't do things different today. 
because we are fallible. We are. But how can we make good choices? I say, first of all, we must choose in line with God's principles. There is much more to life than the outward and the material. And how often in life people see the outward and they see the material. And that's all the same. But there's much more. We ought to base our choices on the word of God. God's word. To think of those words that the Lord spoke to his disciples. If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. I would say secondly, make choices which value relationships over rights. Nowadays, people talk a lot about their rights. And you and I know exactly what our rights are if we go to buy something or we want to return something and you have so many days now to change your mind and all the rest of it. And we're living in a day where there's a lot of rights. And yes, there is a sense whenever it's good to have some rights. Whenever maybe you're making choices. But I would say this here, make choices which value relationships over rights. What did Abraham say to his nephew? Let there be no strife between us. We're brothers here. Coming just after the statement about the Canaanites and the Perizzites in the land, and what do we find whenever Lot is taken captive? We have Abraham risking his life and the lives of others to go and rescue his brother again. Oh, the brother that had done him so much wrong. Why was that? I believe it was because, as the New Testament reminds us, he didn't want any bitterness to harm him because he'd only been destroying himself. This may point out, of course, whenever Abraham said, let there be no strife, we're brothers. This may point out Abraham's concern about how their strife would affect their witness among the heathens and among the pagans. What the world must think whenever they see God's people fighting amongst themselves. What the world must think. What must we do if we're wrong? And I tell you, I'm sure there's many, many times whenever we're wrong. I'm sure there's many times whenever uh, that we're pulled to pieces. And maybe all sorts of things can be said. What ought we to do? Retaliate? Backbite? Stand up for ourselves? No. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, keep walking. Keep your eyes fixed on him. He said, happy are you, blessed are you, when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. Ignore it. Rejoice. And get on with it. Just like in the ministry, a uh, pastor has an ear to listen to all the gossip of the day, he will get us full of it. He'll get us full of it. What have you to do? You have to park it. You have to do that. You have to keep your eyes fixed on God. So much strife could be avoided in a family and in a fellowship. And we set aside our rights and we trusted God. Abraham had a right to choose whatever land that he wanted. And let Lot take the leftovers. In fact, he didn't need to give Lot anything. As I said a couple of weeks ago, I'm sure him and his wife Sarah discussed it many times and said, well, look here, Abraham, God promised this to you. He didn't promise anything to Lot. Let Lot pack up and get out and move on. He's not entitled to anything. But that wasn't Abraham's way of thinking. And then thirdly, at times we must confront sin and we must take a stand for truth. We must confront sin and we must take a stand for truth. The truth that is found in the Word of God. The truth. We must confront sin. I would say, dear friends, today if there's sin in the life, it must be confronted and we must take a stand for truth. I was hearing recently about a preacher that was preaching about COVID-19. 
whatever I, we know about it, maybe some of us don't know a lot, but we've, we've heard plenty of talk about it. But this preacher said that there's no scripture whatsoever to leave a church because of COVID. No scripture whatsoever. But if there's sin, then there's scripture. It has to be dealt with. It has to be faced. You see, what mattered to Abraham was we are brothers, we value his relationship with Lot, he values his relationship with Lot over his right to choose the land. Making choices which value godliness over greed. By faith, Abraham had already renounced everything visible and has already applied the promises of God. So he had no, no need as Lot did. There was no need as Lot did because he chose by sight. Abraham chose by faith. Maybe Abraham wondered, had he done the right thing? But God reminds him that the land was before him. Lot chose by sight and ended up spiritually and financially bankrupt. Sometimes I believe that it is possible for us at times to produce some cause, to hide behind some cause, to focus on some cause, but that cause is perhaps a cover-up for some greater sin that has never been faced. You see, he escaped Sodom, Lot did, with the clothes on his back, and he finishes living in a cave. That was some way for him to finish. A man that had so much was all going to burn up. And so he escapes Sodom with the clothes on his back. He finishes living in a cave. The things he saw and got didn't bring him lasting happiness that he expected. Lot lived for greed. And the sad thing, dear friend, is this here. He lost his family and he lost his testimony. Now, I, I, I'll, I'll say this with all due respects this morning, that whatever your view may be, my view is this, that Lot's family was a family divided in time and divided in eternity. I believe Lot's family are divided today in eternity. His wife, do you remember, the choices that he made affected her, no doubt, too. And whenever they were warned to get out of Sodom, her heart's still there. And she became a pillar of salt. I'm going to, God willing, next week, I'm going to, not, I'm going to pass by the choices, the consequences. We've covered that. But maybe we can ask ourselves the question, Lot, why have you finished in this place called Sodom? Wouldn't it be sad, and it is sad, and it is a reality today, that there are those that walked with God, those who love God, and sin and many other things creep into their lives, and sometimes it's maybe even the spirit of bitterness. And they harm themselves and they harm their family and they push it into their children. What a way to be. There'll be consequences as a result. I trust today that we might supply the, heart, the, the word of God to our individual hearts and our individual needs today. Let's sing our closing hymn it's a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify. You know, I noticed that the Bible college that we went to is all fancy apartments up for sale at present. They're in Lansdowne Crescent. But this was one hymn that we sung so much in Bible college days, reminding us that there is a charge that has been given to us. I think we'll stand again as we sing.
Father, we thank you this morning to have your word. There are many in this world of ours that don't have the word of God, but we one day will be judged as to how we have lived according to your word. And so, Lord, arm us with zealous care to fulfill the charge that you've given to us. And help us, Lord, to walk by faith and not by sight, realizing, Father, that even today, through your word, that you speak to us and you challenge us. And I pray for your blessing upon all who go from us now. And, Lord, bless the homes and the families represented in your house. And we ask you for those of us that tarry around your table that we might see something afresh of Calvary. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>